Well, we've heard the accounts that uh, took place on Good Friday, but now to put a bit of meaning around that, we're going to just spend some time reflecting on an explanation of it from Romans chapter 5. I'm going to read the verses 6 to 11. Apostle Paul uh, writes, as he's explaining the realities of the Gospel, he says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through Him we have now received reconciliation. I was listening to an interview recently where it was a twin, a, a twin brother and sister being interviewed and at one stage they just were reflecting on what life was like growing up as twins and uh, said at, one, at some stages they'd been uh, ac- accidentally mistaken for being a couple, which is a little bit awkward when you're brother and sister... Uh, it leads us to sort of question, what, do, what does love look like when, when we see it? For a brother and sister, they were obviously getting along, obviously something was there that, uh, you know, suggests closeness. Uh, sometimes maybe there's even a, a bit of teasing banter, that's sometimes the way brothers and sisters get along, isn't it? And it's actually sometimes the way romantic couples also get along. If we see a romantic couple, maybe out for dinner, maybe at a movie, how do we know they love each other? Maybe, maybe she snuggles into his arm, rests her head on his shoulder. Uh, you, you see a mother, a mother's love for their child. They're, they're nurturing, they're caring, they're feeding the, child, the, the infant child who, who's totally dependent on them. You see a father who, who reassures their, their hurt child at the, at the park, they've hurt themselves and he loves her and, and, and reassures her. Maybe there's a teacher who, who sees the potential in a in sort of a, a troubled and overactive student, uh, but there's, there's potential and invests in that student. Like, there's, love looks like many different things, doesn't it, in different forms, but we kind of know it when we see it. So what does God's love look like? And does he love me? Uh, do, do, you know, does he love you? They're, they're two really important questions that we want to deal with this morning. What does God's love look like? And for all of us, does God love me? We want to know that God is loving, and there is a bit of a sentiment these days from, from many that God's not very loving. Sometimes, in sort of overt ways, people. Uh, like Richard Dawkins, sort of the outspoken atheist, he's inclined to say some very uh, not, what's the word, not, um, not endearing things about his perspective of God from having uh, read parts of the Bible. Uh, maybe we're not hostile like that, but maybe we, maybe we come across people or maybe we even feel a little bit dubious, like there's things that we read that kind of don't, perhaps don't look very loving. So, is God loving? What does the love of God look like? And then secondly, does He love me? If there's the reality that one day I'm going to face Him, my my life here will end and and somehow I'm going to have to give an account to Him, then how am I going to stand on that day? Is He going to love me or is He going to be hostile towards me? They're really important questions, aren't they? And those two questions are answered so powerfully at the, the events of the cross that we've read about and that we'll explore a little bit, that we think about on Good Friday. And so, so we see the answer, what does God's love look like? Does, is, he, is He loving? Uh, in, in verse 8, it says, God shows His love, or God demonstrates His love for us in this, and then He goes on to talk about His giving of Himself. Jesus died for those He loved. That's what Good Friday is. Being willing to give your life for someone is kind of the ultimate expression of love, isn't it? 
We, we just uh, I heard recently on the news about some bravery awards that had been given out uh, in Australia for extraordinary acts of bravery. People had risked their life so as to rescue someone from a burning house or to rescue someone from other, some other scenario. And it's, it's so profound that we give a national award for it. It's always a risk at using um, sort of a, uh, examples from media, from, from movies, because maybe it sounds like an endorsement of the movie and that's not the intention. You have to decide for yourself what's appropriate. But uh, The Hunger Games is a set of movies. There's actually a set of books that have been produced into movies. Um, it, it tells the, the scenario of a sort of imaginary, but maybe not so imaginary, uh, empire that where they're trying to rule their citizens, they're trying to control their citizens, and the, the citizens are kept in, in 12 different districts, and in order to keep them sort of under, under their control, uh, they have the, the, the annual Hunger Games where two people from every district are chosen at random and they have to go and sort of fight in this big arena and it's basically a fight to the death and there is one survivor at the end uh, to strike fear into the, the people so they don't rise up against anyone. And, and so as the selections are being made, uh, the sort of who turns out to be the heroine Katniss, her sister gets chosen at random, her younger sister. And it's like she doesn't stand a chance. And so, so Katniss, who becomes the, the heroine, she actually volunteers herself to take her sister's place. And it's a, it's a powerful moment, it's a powerful scene, isn't it? Because there's, there's going to be one survivor in 24, there's every likelihood that what she's volunteering is to go to her death for the sake of her sister. And so it's a, it's a powerful expression, isn't it? To give your life, to risk your life for another, it's rare, it's exceptional. And, and Paul points that out, as he says in verse 7, someone will scarcely die for a, a righteous person, maybe we'd say a religious person, but perhaps for a good person, if they're, if they're really seen in practice to live out their, their religion, or they're seen as being a very good person, maybe someone would be convinced to say, that's, that's a worthy sacrifice. But God demonstrates His love by giving His self for bad people. That's, that's the point that Paul is making here. People who had committed cosmic treason against the King of Heaven while we were His enemies is when He gave this great act of love. And so perhaps to think about some of the antics we see from sort of undesirables on the road. Maybe some of you have been going for that parking spot, you've been wandering around and finally you found the parking spot and then someone zips into it right in front when it was clear that that's the parking spot you were after. You're driving down the road and, and, and someone's, the, the, this person like drives in a dangerous manner just so they can get ahead. They're cutting people off, they're uh, disobeying traffic lights and give way signs, or whatever, putting that, making it being a danger to everyone else on the road. They, the traffic can, gets a bit congested and they fly down the emergency lane because they want to get ahead. And you see this going on. Uh, and then you come across them, they've got a flat tyre on the side of the road, or their bonnet's up and there's steam coming out. How inclined are you to stop? And how, oh, poor them, they're really in need. I'd better help them. More likely, we're sitting there thinking, ha, you got it, what's coming to you, and you drive past with great glee and delight. That's the natural way that we respond to enemies, to people who have wronged us. And how does God respond? He gives His life for those who have wronged and those who are His enemies. So, is, God's love, is God loving it's so powerfully demonstrated at the cross that He was willing to die. And not just to die, but as we read the accounts of the death that He died, it's th this intense, extreme pain that He endures of being tortured and brutally murdered, brutally put to death. It's, it's, it's the shame and the humiliation as He's strung up before crowds, completely naked. Beyond all the physical suffering, there's the intensity, the 
the severity of God's righteous judgment being poured upon him as he deals with that. Who, who else would do that for someone? Let alone, who else would do that for someone who is their enemy, who, who is hostile and against them? So is God's loving, is God loving? We see that very powerfully at the cross. But does God love me? Does God love you? Are you able to say, God loves me and I know it? As we try and answer that question, does God love me? We, we instinctively gravitate to answering that question in terms of, am I lovable enough? Would God love me? Is my life good enough? So would God love me? Am I a good enough person? As, you know, when I get to the end and I have to face up to God, is the, is the good going to outweigh the ba- bad? On, on balance, is God going to look at me and say, well, yes, okay, you're a good person. That's instinctively where we go. And, and what sort of evidence are we going to look at? Well, well, you know, perhaps we do a comparison with other people. Sure, there's bad people out there, but I'm not that. Or, or we, we think about, am I committed to the right sort of values and the right sort of causes? Do I care about the right things? Whether that be the environment or I, I'm not a person who is racist or whatever. Maybe we measure it by religious performance. I, I go to church, I serve on an, enough rosters, I'm committed enough. And in terms of answering that question of God, does God love me or will He love me? Paul basically says none of that counts at all. We can't use any of that as the measure. How do we know that God loves us? Because He died for us. And when did He die for me? Not once I'd managed to provide enough evidence that I somehow deserved it, that He would make such a sacrifice for me. He didn't do it once I dealt with the worst aspects of my personality and my behaviour. He didn't do it once I'd reached some standard, some level of religious attainment that I could check the boxes and say, I'm good enough. He did it while we were His enemies. And in fact, that's why He died for us. To take for me, to take for us the penalty that we deserve for having set our life up against Him, for making life all about me. And you might be inclined to think, well, I'm not really someone who makes life all about me, but we, we do, don't we? We, we, think, oh, we go through life and we think, well, I'm committed to family. Yeah, but it's my family that I'm committed to. I mean, well, I'm, I'm going to put, invest myself in my work, but it's my job and it's my, what I'm going to get ahead. And we, we think about our, the, the holiday that we deserve and it's my holiday that I'm going to go on. Like, we just keep turning life in on, on ourselves, like it's all about me. When it, when it should be about acknowledging God as, as supreme. So he pays the penalty that we deserve in the midst of when we were deserving it. And now that he's paid the penalty, justice has been done, the penalty's been paid, what, what was owing has been dealt with, and, and so we, we can be declared not guilty now. And so that's the wonderful reality there in, in verse 9. It says, uh, it says, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. We're not guilty right now because anything that was owing is dealt with and so therefore as it continues on since we're now not guilty we know how much more shall we be saved from the wrath of god so when we have to actually front up to god and we stand him to give an account for our life we say since i'm not guilty i know that i shall not have to face wrath in the future when 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 god faces when i face him Nothing that I've done, nothing that I ever could do, does anything to make me deserve that in any way, shape or form. He does it while we're still against Him. So does God love me? I've got to look at the cross and say, there's, there's my answer. Not my CV of my own qualifications of goodness, uh, not my sort of the defence brief that my little inner lawyer likes to bring out and say, oh, I'll defend myself against the accusations. Uh, I don't look, can't look at any of that. I look at the cross and say, there's my answer. One day we're going to face God and we have to 
uh, sort of the ultimate question is, do, will He welcome me? Will He accept me? And, and what am I going to say when He says, why should I let you in and, and, and to enjoy re- uh, eternity with me? Am I, am I going to say, well, because I tried really hard, because I, I helped so-and-so and different people, I, I served in this way and that way, I gave to people who were in need. Is that where we're going to go? Is that going to be our answer? I, did the, I was committed, I sacrificed. They're all the totally wrong answer. They begin with I and what I'm doing. The, the right answer is, no, when I faced it, what, what, why should God let me in? Because Jesus gave. Because Jesus sacrificed. Because Jesus paid. That's the answer. And so, friends, have you accepted that? Have you accepted your need for that? I needed Jesus to go to the cross because I am His enemy inherently and so I need this solution that He provides for me. Have you accepted there is wrong in you that you cannot make up for? That our default trajectory is enmity towards God, to be against Him? And so, friends, that's what it means to be a Christian. We, we talk about a, a lot of different aspects, Sunday by Sunday, you know, what's the, what's the Christian life? But fundamentally, this is what it means to be a Christian, that we trust in what God has done for us because we needed it. And nothing I do counts one scrap towards deserving anything from God. And so... If we want to be a Christian, we've got to acknowledge it to Him. If, if, if that's not something you've actually done yet, if that's, if that's not where you're at, then, then that's the step we have to take, to, set, to acknowledge it to God and say, Lord, I have wronged you. There are things about my life that are not right. Lord, I'm sorry that I am inclined to grieve you and to not go your direction. And Lord, thank you for your gift. please begin changing me. That, that's, that's how we accept this gift that God has given us. And if you are one who has accepted it, that's, that's fantastic. Um, that's the greatest, most secure place to stand. But are you living like one who's accepted it? Because we very easily kind of accept it and then we start trying to kind of add to it. Don't we? we? We can be inclined to then, well, I'll, then I'll try and rack up some credits. And, and, I, and I start to approach God, even though I sort of accept this gift, I, I then start approaching Him and say, well, I kind of feel like God owes me a good life, kind of feel like God owes me blessing because look how committed I am, look how much better than that person I am. And we slip back into this thinking, I've, it's, it's about me again. Good Friday and the cross is all about Jesus. It's all about what He's done that we never, ever could have possibly done ourselves. It's the most profound demonstration of love. And it's the basis for our reassurance that God loves me. The reassurance you can have that God loves you when we trust in that. Amen. And and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, wonderful gift. We, we don't deserve it, we don't earn it in any way. While we were trying to run our own direction, it was then that you chose to intervene and you did it at such great cost to yourself. So Lord, help us to live that reality. Help us to acknowledge our need of it, to trust 100% in it and to not keep trying to add our own credit to it. It's all about what you've done, such that because of what you've done, we have the privilege of living a life for you. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.